Good morning. <clears throat> if you could be turning in your Bibles, please, to, uh, first of all, Matthew chapter 2. I've got two short passages um, as the basis for the message this morning. Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 13. Which immediately follows on from the, the story of the wise men. Now, when they had departed, that's the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, out of Egypt did I call my son. Then, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its environs, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping, weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted, because they were no more. And the second passage is in the next Gospel, which is Mark, and in chapter 10, And verses 13 to 16. And they began bringing children to Jesus, so that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. Let's pray before I speak on. We are very grateful, Father God, for the gift of your word. Even when it uh, speaks of things which we find uncomfortable. We pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, now crown that gift by opening our minds and our understanding to your word and to what is on your heart. And we pray that we would be responsive and obedient people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I spoke a few weeks ago, uh, it was on the subject of the need for the church to rediscover the prophetic calling it should have to the nation. And I mentioned how I, I sensed that how God is appalled by the treatment of children in our society. Um, I became aware of that when I uh, <clears throat> was in South Africa um, a good many years ago. Um, but I once again now strongly believe that this is a huge concern of God's heart. And uh, one or two people have asked me to elaborate from, from what I said last time. Um, and so these are um, some thoughts I've 
this morning um, on, on that subject uh, because I was reminded um, a, a while ago there was a sad story of, a, of one young girl, I think she was about 13 years old, who had been rushed into an abortion without her parents' knowledge or consent um, and the decision not to consult the parents rightly stirred up a lot of concern and controversy. But amidst all of that controversy, nobody seemed to be asking the question, what does God think about all this? The media had a field day airing what the parents thought and what the school thought and what the government thought and what social commentators thought even what the girl herself uh, the child who was having this baby what she thought but who had bothered to ask what God thought people seem to forget that God has feelings very strong feelings in many cases about what is happening in our society today so I wanted to spend just a few moments this morning looking at scripture in terms of what it reveals about God's heart for children in particular and, and in the light of that ask the question what should the church be saying to society in Britain today in the face of some of the worst child abuse in the history of this nation. Um, let me just begin with a, a lightning overview from the Bible. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever considered it significant that the first commandment that God gives to man in Scripture is be fruitful and increase in number. In other words, have children. That's in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And, and then it seems to me that in Psalm um, 127 verses 3 to 5, it provides us with three potent word pictures describing the tremendous value that God places on children. <clears throat> that Psalm says, Behold, children are a heritage or a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Then moving into the New Testament in Matthew chapter 18 Jesus showed how much he valued children by saying that anyone who harmed them, he said, would be better off having a millstone hung round his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And it's not a verse that gets a lot of preaching um, on. But um, does that not show what Jesus' thoughts are? And, and having laid that launch pad, um, let's come to the passage which I, I read a few moments ago from Mark chapter 10 and, and verse 13. Where the gospel records people were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. The disciples with the best intentions in the world didn't want Jesus to be bothered. He was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way to the cross. He was going to establish a kingdom. And, and babies, well, they weren't that important. They hadn't got a place in all of this. After all, I mean, they, they didn't have the qualifications. They weren't fully mentally developed. They couldn't understand the teaching. They, they're not physically strong. They couldn't follow Jesus everywhere. 
surely you need to be an adult to follow Jesus. <coughs> That's what the disciples were thinking. And if, if you glance back to the beginning of the chapter, you get the context. Because the disciples were having a very important theological discussion. It was on the topic of divorce. And that's not something for children. It's an adult matter. So, when these parents were content with their babies for Jesus to bless them, the disciples tried to sort of fend them off. Uh, now, to understand that the, the, the disciples were not really being callous or, or Victor Meldrew type figures who just disliked kids, um, I, I think we need to unsentimentalize uh, this scene. Our society, uh, until comparatively recently, valued children. And the likelihood is that we, having grown up in that kind of culture, um, uh, we read about this event through the lenses of 20th century values. Um, for we believe that virtually everybody loves children, don't they? Uh, including Jesus. And uh, this is why he wants to pick them up for a little cuddle. This isn't quite what is going on. You see, in Jewish society then, children, as children, were not that well thought of. They were valuable in the sense that they continued the family name, and they assured that the family kept the property when they, they, they grew up, and <coughs> when they, um, they'd provide for their parents, um, in their years of dotage. But otherwise, little children were nobodies. They didn't have any great status, any standing. They'd achieved nothing, and they really didn't have much to offer except dribble. And so the disciples thought, here is Jesus, he's heading on his way towards Jerusalem. He's got this mission of establishing the kingdom, which they hoped would result in a palace and some government positions for them. And so the disciples were gearing themselves up to become people of importance. And then Jesus doesn't want to be delayed and bothered by some pesky little kids. They're nobodies. And so, in no uncertain terms, they let the parents know this. They rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, we're told he became angry, indignant, livid, actually. But why? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 14. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, and here's a solemn statement that Jesus is about to so get this. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Do you see what the issue is? What is at stake? It is all to do with entering the kingdom of God. Inheriting eternal life. Jesus says, let them through. Children are very important. You've got your ideas all wrong. 
Your idea is children can't have any of this until they're like us as adults. I say you adults can't have anything of what I'm talking about until you're like these children. It is a total reversal of ideas. We live in a sophisticated adult world. But Jesus still says, with all of your sophistication, you need to become like children. To such belongs the kingdom of God. You see, our ideas are so sophisticated. We've all got to be terribly grown up and terribly intellectual. And Jesus says, your ideas are all wrong. You've got to become like little children. There is something about toddlers, infants, that Jesus points to and says, this is the key to everything, to my kingdom, to eternal life, to salvation. What is important is to be found in what you people think is unimportant. Now, what was it about children that Jesus felt was so important? Uh, I mean, infants and children have nothing to give to Jesus. They've got no resources, financial or in any other way. But Jesus says that is human judgment. Those children do have something to offer to us, if only an example. And it's now that he draws out the most profound lesson. It's not their innocence or their purity that Jesus talks about here, because we sadly pass on to our children our own human nature, don't we? So what quality in these children is Jesus pointing to? Well, I, I think there are four things in a child you'll find in every child that you will need before you get into the kingdom of God. And here they are. Number one, first of all, you need an open mind. Have you noticed how a child is prepared to believe anything? They've got a wide open mind. The older that we grow, the more we close our minds. The more we want to argue, the more we want to say, ah, I don't believe that. But a little child, if you tell them something, they'll accept it. An open mind, willing to believe the truth. And the second thing about a child is that they have an open hand. They are willing to receive. And the further we go in life, the less we are willing to hold out our hands to someone else. Until we get to the point where we're old age pensioners and we could get assistance, we could get help, but we're too proud to have it. We call it charity or uh, maintaining our independence. A child doesn't say, I won't have that chocolate. I don't like handouts. A child is willing to open their hands and to receive it. And Jesus says, when you come like a little child, if you're willing to say to God, I will gladly have that. I can't save myself, but I will take it from you. Then the kingdom of God opens right up for you. That's the second thing. But the third thing about a child is that, that they also have an open heart. If you try and love a child properly, the child will respond to you in love. If you try and love an adult, well, they might say, oh, I wonder what their motive is. I wonder why they're doing that. You see, we get suspicious. 
we're let down by people, we stop trusting them, we become cynical sometimes and resentful. A little child doesn't think like that. As it grows older, sadly, with the experiences of life, a child's heart can begin to close up and the adult mindset sets in. But a fourth characteristic of children, particularly infants, is that they cling. A baby instinctively knows that it's helpless. The human baby is actually about the most helpless of all the species on earth. We need looking after so many more years than almost any other species of life on earth. And this is what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. No, actually, correction, he didn't say that. He said the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In other words, there is a quality here which those who find the kingdom need to have. An attitude. And the attitude is, I'm not an independent person. I am not a strong person. I'm a weak, helpless person. And I've got to cling to someone else. And being born again means that you start life all over again, utterly dependent on God as your father, on your heavenly parent. You see, the pattern of life is this, that for the first 20 years or so of your life, you're dependent on your parents. But it is right that you should ultimately become independent of them. It's right that you should grow up. But replace it with that is so important. And unfortunately most of us replace it with an adult independence. And what we're meant to do is replace our dependence on an earthly father with a lifelong dependence on a heavenly Father, we're to go on clinging. And incidentally, can I just point out that um, it was not the mothers who brought their children to Jesus in this passage. It would have been the fathers. And um, the adjective that's used here is masculine. Um, it is a reflection, I think, of our day and age that every hymn which has been written about this event in the sort of 19th and 20th century era talks about <coughs> the mothers of Salem bringing their children to Jesus. But all the way through the Hebrew scriptures it is the fathers who blessed their children. From Noah blessing Shem and Japheth to Abraham blessing Isaac and Jacob blessing his sons who then became the fathers of the, the twelve tribes of Israel. These types of spiritual blessings were very important in Jewish culture. And it was the tradition at the time of Jesus that fathers would bring their children to the local synagogue where the elders would join the Father in a prayer of blessing. And as Jesus was considered to be a rabbi, this would be entirely consistent with that custom. And there's an interesting contrast, I think, to be found in this story. That Jesus touched the children when he blessed them put his hand upon them. Because that is something that the scribes and the Pharisees never did. They made it a point not to touch people at all because they believed it would defile them. 
religiously speaking. Jesus never held himself back from people in that way. And, and I mentioned this um, and want to lay a certain degree of stress on this. In God's sight, the father of the house is responsible for the spiritual upbringing of his children. And in 99% in of, of homes outside the church, I find that the father, if he's there at all, takes not the slightest interest. That it's left to the mother to do everything, anything religious for the children. And that is a complete reversal of God's plan. Every father will be held responsible for the spiritual development of their children. <clears throat> and before I further reply, I think what scripture is showing us about God's heart for children. Um, I just want to turn to that one other, uh, to one other Bible passage which is in Matthew chapter 21 verse 14 it says, the blind and the lame came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and they said, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Now Jesus was of course quoting from Psalm 8 and verse 2. And in, in fact that psalm goes on to give a reason why praise has been ordained in the lips of children and infants. It is to silence the foe and the avenger to silence the foe and the avenger. I take that to mean that children praising God are an effective way of silencing the devil. Did you know that? Is that why the devil is out to prevent the church from discovering the wealth of potential in believing children? And I believe that at this present time, God is speaking to the church prophetically to tell us about his concern for children. There's a sense in which the way society treats its children is a barometer for how godly or godless that society has become. A nation's future is secured for better or for worse through the legacy of its children. And I, I want to conclude today by simply drawing your attention to what has been happening to our children in the last few years. I did say a minute or two ago that our 20th century culture generally value, valued children but I have to say I don't think that is any longer the case in the 21st century. Take a portion for a start. Why is a germ considered to be life on Mars but an unborn baby in the womb isn't considered to be life on Earth? And the number of children who have been killed before they even ever got a chance to draw breath is staggering. But not even in our churches do we ever hear much said about it. Much of the church is apathetic and indifferent to it. It's like the genocide in the Christmas story when Herod killed all the boys under two years old. Nobody ever mentions it. 
it doesn't feature in our observance of Christmas. It would spoil things. You see, it is all too easy, especially when it comes to how we think about Christmas. Um, we, can, we can be tempted to think of Jesus as if he sort of hovers above the brokenness of our world, as if he is sort of somewhat detached and disconnected from it, uh, and, and keeps it at arm's length one way or another. But Matthew's Gospel reminds us that if we view Jesus that way, then we're not seeing him as he is. The Son of God himself came into this world as a child. A child who was on the hit list to be destroyed in a genocide. And that means that Christ is truly engaged with and at work in this broken world right now. He cares about what is happening here. And he cares enough to do something. Because it doesn't stop with abortion. Child sex trafficking is another appalling abuse that is pretty much ignored. It's controversial. It can upset race relations. So the government, the police, social services say and do virtually nothing. And now we have the whole transgender movement resulting in children being pressurized through the school curriculum to question their God-given identity, generating confusion and all sorts of psychological problems. And that's before we even get to the damage of these last two years, where we've enforced mask wearing so that children can't read faces and learn to communicate without impediments. We've closed schools, we've cancelled exams, we've forced children into isolation, telling them that if they didn't behave, they'll kill granny. And so now we're told that the NHS has seen a monumental rise in children attempting suicide, children self-harming, children with anxiety and mental health problems, and now children have become the target for the COVID vaccines. When we were constantly assured that children were in an at-risk category. But now they have to be vaccinated to protect the adults. They've become human shields. We bribe them, we entice them, we coerce them. And I don't even think about the long-term consequences. What sort of society sacrifices its own children's health and well-being for some kind of notional risk reduction for adults? A journalist actually wrote recently that it might sound cruel, but a small number of deaths might be worth it. That's the mindset. the grown-ups are meant to protect the children. That is how civilized society ought to behave. When World War II broke out in 1939, in the first three days Operation Pied Piper moved one and a half million children out of the cities and towns where they were deemed to be at most risk from bombing and they were evacuated to the countryside. That is how society used to behave. And if Christians can't be in the forefront of seeking to protect the children, then our society is indeed lost. That's what's on my heart this morning. Test it, please because the Bible requires any alleged prophetic utterance to be tested by the yardstick of God's word and God's heart. 
but my own sense that we in something as demonic as King Herod when Jesus was born. And it's only the Church of Jesus Christ that can challenge that in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not offering a blueprint as to how to go about that, but whatever form it takes, I believe that Scripture calls us as a church to see the world as it really is, that we might see Christ as he really is, that we might see our lives and the calling on our lives as they really are. It will entail investing prayerfully, spiritually and actively in the deepest concerns of God's heart. And with that recognition, as we see this reality more and more, it should galvanize us the more to engage with the world as it truly is. To cling to Christ as he truly is. And to live as Christ's body as we were truly meant to. And to press forward to the crown of life that we will truly receive through his grace when we become like little children and enter the kingdom of God. Amen.